Please take your Bibles and go to Nehemiah chapter 4, if you would, please. Nehemiah chapter 4. You know, these days you're almost afraid to clear your throat. And uh, as I've mentioned before, that uh, I do take blood pressure medicine. And one of the uh, side effects of that is a little bit of a tickle in my throat. So if I'm up here sometimes coughing, I don't want you to know I'm not sick. Now some may debate that, uh, but at the same time, I'm not sick, okay? Uh, this is just something I have to uh, contend with, but I want to set your minds at ease that uh, uh, there's no problem. I'll try not to breathe on you. And I notice that people pretty much sort of keep their distance from me when I'm preaching. If I spit and sputter, uh, you'll understand that. But uh, <laughs> uh, what I'm going to preach on this morning, I entitled the message, The Dirty Crib. The Dirty Crib. Now, I'm not thinking in light of a baby crib. I'm thinking about in the farming community, they talk uh, about the crib being where the animals are fed and kept and so on. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, you know we're going through the book of Nehemiah and it's talking about rebuilding the walls. And I thought it was interesting that in light of the building program that we're involved in as a church family, that we would begin preaching through these books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And uh, as you know, we've already uh, went through and preached about 12 messages through uh, Ezra. And uh, it talks about rebuilding the altar of the Lord, establishing worship, and then the temple dealing with the inside of an individual, of course, that's the representation. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And then, of course, now, Nehemiah is coming to the city of Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, as well as to put the gates back into place. And so, this is just fitting, I think, for us as a church family. I remember years ago, this is probably back in the late 90s, uh, we were preaching through the pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. I always add Philemon to that. And um, as we were preaching through that, then right after that series, about six months after that, it was interesting how the Lord just had us go through some circumstances here at the church. But I felt like uh, God was preparing us during that series for what we would be going through. And so God knew, even though we didn't know what we, we would be going through. And so I think this series is important for us today as well. The other day I took one of my grandsons, Lucas, uh, out to see the horses and the cattle. And uh, I told him as we were, uh, we crossed over the uh, fence and, and uh, we went into the pasture and, and uh, I told him, I said, now you be careful where you step. Uh, because, uh, you know, I don't want you to get your feet all messy. And so he spent quite a bit of time hopping around in that pasture. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, as you have livestock, whether it's for pleasure or whether it's for food, uh, you're going to have to put up with some mess. And, you know, sometimes we think uh, not just in the physical realm, but we think in the spiritual realm that, when we go through things in the Christian life that everything ought to be smooth, no ripples in the water, no problems to deal with. And that's just not a fact of life. Not even the fact of life as far as a believer is concerned. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 4, the scripture says these, these words, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by the strength of the ox. In other words, in every endeavor of life, you're going to have to deal with some unpleasantries. And sometimes because when we get saved and we feel the burden of our sin rolled away, as the chorus uh, goes, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away, every burden of my heart rolled away. And so we realize that there is a, a, a freedom that we experience in Christ at salvation but then as we begin to live the Christian life, we begin to understand, though, that we are in a warfare. That's why Paul tells Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as you and I live the Christian life, we're going to have to understand that we're going to have to deal with some of those unpleasantries. We're going to be in that warfare, so to speak. In pursuing the will of God for your life, you are going to face trials 
and troubles and problems and even opposition. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, the scripture says these words, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, notice what they did to the Lord Jesus. If you would go to Matthew chapter 26, which we won't do that uh, this morning, you would read the account of his betrayal in the garden. You would read the account of how he was buffeted. And that word buffet, we don't really use it. It's not common uh, today in our speech. But when we talk about buffet, it's actually talking about beating, an intense beating. It's not just talking about a slap across the face, a uh, push. Uh, it's talking about just really wailing away at someone. And they buffeted the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they would blindfold him, they slapped him, they hit him, they platted a crown of thorns on his head, and we're not talking about rose bush thorns. The thorns that they have in the Holy Land were sometimes up to four inches long. And when it says they platted that crown, they didn't just set it on his head, they put it on his head and then they rammed it into his skull. And then they pulled the very hairs of his beard out by the roots. Uh, that's what they did to the Lord. They beat him. And he did that uh, for us. Amen. And so they did that and then they crucified him. They put those nails in his hand. They put those nails in his feet. They hung him up where he had to fight for every breath that he took. Here was the perfect son of God. If you go to John chapter 15... Uh, the Lord says to his disciples, he said, you know, you have to understand something. The people who persecute you and criticize you for doing my work and spreading the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not really you they're after and that they're upset about. They're really upset with me. He said, they hated me before they hated you. And I always think that because we are imperfect and he is perfect, if they'll do that to the Son of God, what chance do we have to get out of this life as imperfect ones with problems and situations and issues and even the imperfections sometimes of living the Christian life and trying to still tell the good news of Jesus Christ? Uh, do you and I think that we're not going to be persecuted, that we're not going to be mocked and sometimes have to give that which is precious to us? Take your Bibles, if you would. I'd like us to turn there, a familiar passage of Scripture, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And you know, we always talk about the Apostle Paul and what a great saint he was. And you know, he was. Before that, he was a great sinner. In Timothy, it tells us that he was the chiefest of sinners. I always say the chiefest of sinners has been saved. So if you'd like to be saved, you can be saved. And so that's, a, that's a, a message of hope for those who don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But here the Apostle Paul at this juncture, he has been saved, he's been trained by the Lord, he's a church planter, and you'd think that because he is so blessed and so used by God, so filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that he wouldn't encounter difficulties in life that everything would just be rosy and nothing could be further from the truth. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'll get there. I'll begin reading here in verse 23. The Bible says these words, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. It says, in journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. 
The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Artis, the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desires to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, and he's given a personal testimony here. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear. Lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. This is the same one who writes the book of Philippians that tells us how to have a joyful Christian mind. And he writes in Philippians chapter four and verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And so let's not think for one minute as we seek to do the will and work of God that we're going to go through unscathed, that we're going to go through without a challenge that we're not going to have to battle some things in life. We'll have to battle with our own carnality as well as the carnality and the attack of the wicked one. Now, when you look at Nehemiah chapter four, I don't know if you're taking notes or not, but I've got the outline as such for uh, Nehemiah chapter uh, four. I look at uh, the critics in verses one to three and verses seven and eight. Then we have number two, the challenges and that takes in verses 4 to 6 and verses 9 to 12. We see the charge in verses 13 to 18, and then the cunning response in verses 19 to 23. So we're going to work through this. And let's read from Nehemiah chapter uh, 4, and let's read the first three verses and then verses 7 and 8 as we deal with the subjects uh, of critics. It says here, But it came to pass when Sanballat, heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah goes, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Drop down to verses 7 and 8. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. It's interesting as I, of course, you may do the same thing with technology being what it is. I do have a LinkedIn uh, app and I went to LinkedIn this morning and I saw this picture on LinkedIn that had an eagle flying and it had a crow that has, was on the back of this eagle and was picking 
at the back of this eagle. And the one who posted this said, you know, the eagle does not spend its time fighting with the crow. The eagle just, what the, the eagle does is spreads its wings and begins to fly. And it begins to fly higher and higher and higher. And it goes so high that after a while the oxygen level for the crow is expended and it drops off and the eagle continues to fly on. And you know, when you think of the critics, it's so important for us to understand that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so you and I need to understand the principle of life and the principle of the Christian life is, as you and I live for the Lord Jesus Christ, we will face criticism. We will face opposition. It's a fact of life. Someone has well said, if you don't want to be criticized, say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. Someone else said, critics are like the poor. You have them with you always. And you know, that's so true. You just stop and think about those things that you have lived in life and sought to do and how you've been criticized in the doing of it. Now, when we look at Nehemiah chapter four, we see the critics attacked from several fronts. Number one, we see that they had some personal anger issues that built up to such a point on the inside that it drove them to action. And you find that here in verse one. It all started really with one man, Sanballat, when he heard what the Jews were doing, it says that he was wroth. He got so intensely angry at what they were doing in rebuilding the city of Jerusalem that he, he was moved to indignation and it just spilled out of him. And so you and I have to understand as we deal with the world and as we spread the gospel, they're not always going to be, you know, wanting our message. They're not going to always embrace our message. Uh, it could be due to some insecurities in their life. It could be that they have been going in a certain direction all their life, maybe in a generational way, and they're afraid of being faced with the truth that will cause them to need and want to change. And it's sometimes it's so much easier to stay in the same rut that you found yourself in. Someone said a rut, rut is nothing more than a grave with both ends knocked out. And as you and I live the Christian life, God's going to pull us out of the rut of life. And we're going to be walking a road that we've never walked before, but yet we can stand and walk in the strength and power of his might. Amen. So we find here in Nehemiah chapter four that he had this, he was driven by this inner rage. And then as we move on through this passage, we see that others picked up on the criticism. You know, I always say this, misery loves company. Uh, no one backslides and wants to backslide by themselves. They always want somebody else to join them in their backslidden condition. And the critics are the same way. They're never satisfied with themselves just being critical. They want to spread that venom. They want to have others join in with their criticism. And we notice that they were really, as Sanballat is being a critic, we see that Geshem and Tobiah as well join in the criticism. And they're the three main power brokers that cause the bulk of the problem. It's just like the teens during the week of camp, uh, they use that passage of scripture and I believe it's Galatians chapter four, it says, who did hinder you? Uh, you did run well, but who did hinder you? And Normally when there's some hindrance happening in our lives for the cause of Christ, there's usually someone involved that's either throwing cold water on the fires of evangelism, the fires of revival, the fires of you walking with God. There's usually somebody involved to try, I always say, to cool your jets. You and I need to expect that. We ought not be dismayed by that, but we ought to move forward even in the face of that kind of criticism. But we notice they tried to cause enough trouble to if not stop the work of God, to at least slow it up, to dig their heels in, cause enough of distraction where God's work will not go forward. The devil hasn't changed his tactics. 
And we could go from this passage of scripture to others and show other Bible examples of those who were seeking to spread the gospel. You go to the book of Acts and right after the ascension, you've got Peter and John being opposed. We have the city officials coming and saying, hey, you ought not be preaching in this name. And in Acts chapter five, Peter says, hey, you know, you, you determine what you're gonna do because we can't do anything more but to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here the critics. I also see this, there's the challenges, the challenges that we face as believers. And I, I want us as we go through this series, as I've mentioned just about every message, let's not just look at this from a historical standpoint. Let's take these things and apply it to what we may be going through today and how this affects our life today. The lessons we can learn from them for today so that we are wise in the way we handle the situations that come our way. The first response many times that we have when we are opposed or we're criticized is usually a fleshly one. Uh, the first thing we wanna do is probably act and uh, give some verbal reprimand back, or we wanna do something. We wanna give them a piece of our mind or we wanna give them a piece of our fist. We wanna do something, remember how Peter was, we just talked about this on Wednesday night where uh, when Judas came and planted the kiss on the, on the cheek of the Lord Jesus, Peter draws his sword, cuts off Malchus's ear, and the Lord says, put that away. I can call 12 legions of angels to deliver me. And then he reaches down and he heals Malchus's ear. And so you see our response many times in the face of criticism, first off, is the wrong one. And so we have to make sure of some things when we are faced with a critic in opposition. Let's read verses four to six here of our text, Nehemiah chapter four. Here Nehemiah says, hear, O our God. Now this is a prayer. It's a prayer. He says, hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. You know what I like about that? It wasn't that, you know, sometimes when we pray to God, I'm afraid we try to talk to him the way we think he wants to hear us, not necessarily the way we feel or the burden of our heart or what's going through our mind. And that's one of the things when you read the Psalms, I mean, it says that David poured out his complaint. You know, there, there are times where he says, oh Lord, how long? And here you find uh, Nehemiah, he's praying to God. He says, God, you've got to do something. You've got to intervene here. You've got to turn this around. Instead of them hindering us, you've got to hinder them. There's that honesty and transparency and openness before God. He is touched with a feeling of our infirmities. He knows what we're going through. So go ahead and talk to the Lord. I'm not saying be disrespectful, but at the same time, be transparent with the Lord. He knows what you're going through and he will help you. He will strengthen you through that time because he cares for us. Casting all your care, all your worries, all your anxieties on him for he careth for you, the Bible says. He says this, turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, verse five, and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Look what he says after he prays. So built we the wall. And all the wall was joined together into the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Drop down to verse 9. Nevertheless, because they had some more uh, opposition here in verses 7 and 8 that we looked at already, he says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God. Notice that every time he faced opposition, what did he do first? He prayed first. Many times we wanna act first, pray later. And so we need to learn this lesson because even in Timothy it says, first of all. And so first of all, we ought to pray. And see what that will do is that will take the venom of our carnality out of our hands. 
And it says here, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, from all places when she shall return unto us, they will be upon you. So we see here the nation of Israel here at this point, these builders, they were facing some serious challenges. And instead of just going and acting according to the flesh, they first of all got God's mind on it. And they're able to get God's perspective on it. And that would help us many times in our relational issues and so on, family members and co-workers and neighbors and other uh, circumstances, relationships like that. The first thing we ought to do rather than get into a verbal confrontation is pray. Pray about it. So the next time you are criticized, pray first. The next time that you have somebody say something mean towards you, pray first. You say, well, well you, you expect me just to turn around and walk away? Yeah, that's exactly what you may need to do. You may need to give yourself some space so that you can get a hold of God first and then respond the way he would have you respond. Nehemiah prayed for God to expose the people as well as the motivation and methods the enemy was using to hinder the attack. You see, if any man lacks wisdom, James 1, 5, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And so when you're in those types of situations, don't you need the wisdom of God? Sure we do. We need God's mind on the matter. And he says, you know, if you'll just pull back a little bit, ask for my direction and my help, I'll do that for you. Amen. I like that, don't you? And they did not let the, the, these people did not let the critics keep them, though, from building the wall. The Bible here said in verse 6, for the people had a mind to work. In other words, they're going to get the job done no matter what comes their way. And that's the kind of attitude we need to have in living the Christian life and doing right. We need to do right on purpose. And we need to say, look, we may be opposed. People may try to hinder us. We may have to use plan B sometimes. But at the same time, we're going to get the will of God done for our life. And we have to have that kind of determination. Amen. Let's take our Bibles, if you would. And just see from James chapter 2, I think you need to understand that there's a, there's a dual role here that the Bible points out to us in the scriptures that deals with faith as well as works. Now, of course, we know that we're not saved by works. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, we are saved by grace, amen, through faith. But in other words, we don't work to get saved. But because we are saved, we work. And that's the truth here of James chapter 2, if you would. I want to begin reading here verse 14. What doth it profit my brethren? He's talking to saved people. Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? <laughs> if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. He says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? And if you go to Genesis chapter 22, that account, 
you see where Abraham believed God. And because he believed God that Isaac was the child of promise, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that Abraham had such faith because God said that Isaac was the child of promise that even though Abraham would take his life, Isaac's life, that God would raise him from the dead because God would keep his word. He believed God and because he believed God, he acted on that belief to even potentially sacrifice his son. In other words, he wasn't saved by the faith, but because he had the faith, he went to do what God had told him to do. And that's what James is trying to get across here. He says, was not Abraham our father justified, declared righteous by works, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. It was put to his account. And that's from chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Another strength uh, positive for your King James Bible. You have the doctrine of imputation, and it talks about the account there. So here you have it uh, defining each other. It gives you clarity in regards to that account. He says, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now here's the thing. When you trust Jesus Christ as your personal savior and you say you believe, there is a transaction that takes place between the spirit of God and the heart of man. And then you are in essence born again and that is something that takes place in the inner man. What James is doing though is James is saying, look, if you say you have Jesus in your heart, then you ought to live like it. And so if you say that you believe God, then you need to live like you believe God, amen? And so it's not a contradiction, it's just a completion saying, look, before God, God sees the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, right? And so God knows whether you're saved or not, but man doesn't. And the only criteria that man can use is your verbal talk as well as your living conversation. What you do, do what you say you possess on the inside and who you possess on the inside, is that how you live on the outside? So in other words, if you're gonna go out and live like the devil, don't be surprised when people think you're of the devil. If you go and live in the ways of the world, don't be surprised when people say, hey, they're worldly. But if you live like God lives and that's holy, and you seek to be holy, and you fulfill that command, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, be ye holy for I am holy, then don't be surprised when people say, that's a godly person, amen? And so we see the challenges here that the people were faced with. There is a combination, as you and I live the Christian life, there's a combination of faith and work in fulfilling God's will for your life. Now, look at verses 11 and 12, if you would, again. You notice here, it says, And our adversaries said, they shall not know. In other words, intimidation is one of the chief tools that the critics and the opposers of Christianity will use. They will try to intimidate you. And what that does is they, they bluster around and they pass this and they pass that and they say this and say that and they try to intimidate you. That's what it talks about in 1 Peter when it says that the devil is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may, he may devour. Boy, he roars at you and you, oh, you know, you're, you're afraid, you're startled, you're, you're afraid to go forward. You want to run the other way because you're intimidated. But in Christ... You have the victory, amen. amen? And so you see that. So we see the challenges. Number three, you see the charge, verses 13 to 18. Therefore I set in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places. I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them. 
You know, God's not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Amen? Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears of the shields and the bows and the habergons, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which built it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and to build it, and so build it. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. When you and I do the work of God, we're going to have to have a tool to build in one hand, and we're going to have to have the sword in the other. And who, what is the sword? The sword is the Word of God. Amen? That's Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. And I said unto the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. Now, we have to understand this in God's work. You've got to be flexible. You know, we're learning that around here. We have to be flexible. Uh, I, told, I met with the staff uh, pastors this morning, and I said, guys, we're going to be flexible. We don't know what to expect today. We don't know how things are going to go. I'm sure there's going to be some adjustments that we have to make. We don't know how many are going to be in the tent. We don't know how many are going to be in the auditorium. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know who's going to be here, who's not going to be here. I mean, we don't know how everybody's going to react to things. And so we just have to be flexible. We may have to make some changes along the way. In doing God's work, we have to be flexible. You see that with the Lord Jesus Christ. You read the gospel accounts and you find that sometimes it got so intense that he sort of slipped off in the crowd. Other times he faced him right head on, turned over the money changers tables and said, hey look, I'm chasing you out of here. You're making my father's house a den of thieves when it's supposed to be a house of prayer. So he was flexible in how he handled the various situations and we have to as well. Let's go to Acts chapter 16, and I'm just about done. I'm going to have to draw things to a close. I, I tell you what, you get into these passages of Scripture, and it's just the way the Bible opens itself up to you. You just say, wow, you know, it, it's just exciting. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6, the Bible says these, Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were, were look at this, forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. You know, you read that and you go, I mean, the Holy Spirit didn't want the Word of God preached there. That's right. That's right. That's what the Bible says. Amen? I mean, we, we sometimes think, oh, just so the gospel's preached. Hey, we need the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. And we need to follow the Word of God. He says there, after they were come, verse 7, to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not, didn't allow them to go there. And then he says in verse 8, And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So here we see that, hey, uh, they were opposed, but they said, look, we are going to fulfill the word of God, but we have to be flexible in the fulfillment of it. And we need to do the same. So don't be afraid that when changes happen in the way you worship, in the way that you live out your Christian life and experience, because life is fluid that way. We don't know what's around the bend. We don't know what tomorrow holds for us. Jesus Christ could come, but also says, take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. In other words, sometimes we spend so much time worrying about Monday that we're not taking care of what the Lord wants us to do on Sunday. And it's so critical for us to keep that perspective. Nehemiah, I see here about the charge that, 
They're getting opposition and so on. And we find here that he reminds the people of the promises of God. And look what it says here in verse 14 of chapter 4. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. <laughs> also, we need to understand that they were also fighting and standing for the truth and paying a price for their loved ones. Notice he said, look, you're standing for what God wants you to do, but also think about those that you love. Dads, you need to think about your wife. You need to think about your children. You need to think about your grandchildren. That's one of the reasons why we need to work hard at keeping this church sound in the faith, relying on the word of God, standing firm, kindly but firm, for the cause of Christ, continuing to give out the gospel. And I tell people, we can disagree on a lot of things, but we cannot disagree on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are taking the stands that we stand for, why? Uh, yes, for the Lord. But also as Nehemiah said, hey look, we're doing this for God, but remember your families. Remember those that are coming after, remember your neighbors. Remember those you worship with. Remember, remember the charge is given to us. And here we find that the work <laughs> needed to all, they needed to always be on guard. You would think by having a sword uh, on their side, you'd think by having one weapon in a hand and a trowel in the other, so to speak, you'd, you'd think that they would do less work. You'd think they'd do half the work. But they finished building this wall in record time. It doesn't make sense. And as you and I try to do the work of God and we fulfill the will of God for our lives, there's going to be a lot of things that won't make sense. But we look at that and say, wow, what great things God has done. And he's used us to do it. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. We find the cunning response in verses 19 to 23. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. <laughs> I like that. They still had to put their sword on, strap it to their side. The guy had the trumpet there ready to sound the alarm. They knew they would physically have to take up arms and do what they needed to do, but they also recognized that God would fight the battle for them, but he would do it through them. And that's what happens today. He uses human instrumentality to get the work done. In Psalm 20, verse seven, the Bible says these words, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Folks, the bottom line is God's work takes work. Amen? It takes work. You do your part because God will always do his part. And you and I will never be disappointed as we do what he tells us to do the way he tells us to do it. It's a life of blessing, not free from challenges, not free from the critics, but yet we have the blessings and the presence and fullness of God on our lives to where we meet him one day and hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. Regardless of the opposition faced, that they faced Nehemiah, saw to it that the work continued on. And that's what we need to do. God's will for our lives, no matter what, needs to continue on. As the musicians play, let me encourage you, if there's a decision you need to make this morning to make it, I, I believe from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, that when God's word is given, there's a work that's being done in people's minds and hearts. 
And during this invitation time, we're just encouraging you to do what God tells you to do. Make the decisions that he wants you to make. Start here. It's a whole lot easier to make those decisions here than it is out there. You make them here, get his energy and power and word on you and in you. And then you can withstand when you get out there. If you're here today and you're not saved, meaning that if you were to die today and you're not sure where you would spend eternity, let me encourage you. God has the answer for you and he wants to be your savior. And so if you have some doubts about your eternal destiny, you're not sure where you would wake up, in heaven or hell, but you'd like to know that heaven is your home for all eternity. Why don't you come right now? Let one of these men know, hey, I need to be saved, or I need to know more about this. And let us take God's word and show you the way of salvation. It's there for us. The greatest decision you'll ever make this side of eternity is to accept Jesus Christ.